Good morning to everybody attending the presentation. Uh, as we're discussing the idea of improving earthquake resiliency uh, through the use of post-earthquake clearinghouses, it's, imposed, it's obviously important to realize that we're trying to gather uh, information and data to be able to be used in advance of future events. Uh, the information and the data takes many different types of forms and it can be applied many different types of ways. Uh, but let's look at why it's necessary to have this sort of process to begin with. Uh, with an overview uh, of the presentation that I'm giving here, we want to be able to look at the actual earthquake risk and resilience within the U.S., uh, specifically where are earthquakes most prevalent, sp population trends, uh, built, built environment and earthquake risk, and then the importance of the investigations in informing science and supporting resilience or the actions taken uh, afterwards uh, post-event. And then I'm going to step into the physical clearinghouses discussion where we can look at some of the existing plans or frameworks that are there. Uh, we can discuss a little bit of the implementing of post-earthquake physical technical clearinghouses and uh, plans and requirements that are associated with that. And how the data gathered, which we talked about just a second ago, is, is actually uh, becomes very functional to be able to be used. Needless to say, anytime that you're trying to gather data and transmit information, you need to be able to have the communication as well as coordination. So right off the bat, we un understand uh, that a lot of mapping and a lot of uh, registration of events has already occurred. So as we're looking at the earthquake risk and resilience, within the U.S., we see that on the uh, western coast of the U.S. that there is a higher probability of occurrence and typically a higher magnitude of event uh, as is recorded uh, within our history. But that is not to say that that is the sole uh, existence of earthquakes. If we look at the map uh, on the left-hand side of the slide, you'll see that the central U.S., has, has specifically around the New Madrid uh, fault line, has got some very criticality of issues that are there with respect to population, transportation, and infrastructure. And then if we wanted a more recent example of an event that had a dramatic impact on the U.S., uh, even though it was a very minor one, we could go back to the 2011 uh, magnitude 5.8 earthquake in Mineral Louisa, Virginia which according to the U.S. was the most widely felt earthquake in, in, in their recorded history, according to the USGS. But again, we need to understand that the higher probability and the larger events are typically going to be located on the west portion of the coast of the U.S. Uh, into British Columbia and the Yukon Territory and uh, down into South America in that direction. And that's why I provided the slide there showing the 7.0 magnitude or higher. When we talk about risk and resilience in the U.S., it makes sense for us to start looking at this in terms of risk to population as well as risk to uh, the built environment. Currently, the U.S. population is uh, estimated to be at approximately 327,167 plus uh, folks. Obviously, that changes day to day, so any number we put up there is only going to be an approximation to begin with. And we need to recognize that over 51 million live on the West Coast. So by going back to the other slide, we see an immediacy of hazard with the uh, high probability of occurrence to a tremendous portion of the population within the U.S. Among the fastest growing cities include Seattle, Provo, Boise, Bed Redmond, and, and, and Los Angeles. So these in the U.S. when we have the fastest cities, we're looking at an increase of risk to population, but also to the built environment that's going on there. Plus the fact that in some cases, the uh, built environment is going up so fast that they're not being able to make repairs or changes to uh, prior existing built environment to be able to make that more resilient or capable of sustaining uh, impacts from an event. It would be bad of us not to recognize that approximately 13% of the entire United States is defined as having special needs. Those special needs can include everything from communication concerns that have to do with uh, physiological issues or even language issues, or it can be, have to do with uh, physical capacity to be able to take care of oneself. As of 2014, approximately all half of all people live in earthquake zones. Again, I'll point out that we have the earthquake zones that are in the New Madrid fault line, uh, some that are on the East Coast, uh, but higher and more extensively, again, we're looking at the West Coast as it's moving forwards. 
The ICC building codes are updated every three years, which is a wonderful thing to be able to say. But the reality of it is, is that ICC building codes also face additional issues that come up uh, in terms of being able to improve the resiliency of the building of the built community. Those issues include adoption, the grandfathering of, of structures that have been uh, previously built that are exempt from being updated into the current building codes, the functional recovery component of those um, structures becomes very minimal in many respects, even though there is a larger effort being moved towards using that concept for new construction. Functional recovery is the ability of a structure to be able to retain its functionality uh, or have that functionality restored as uh, very, very quickly after an event occurs. Uh, there's a lot of work being done in this area. Uh, these ICC building codes are, of course, just for structures and don't necessarily uh, collate with uh, infrastructure components that are involved in too. Typically within the United States, part of the infrastructure that is the most vulnerable uh, that is there uh, is bridges. So when we have the bridges, if you're talking about a shift of approximately one foot, uh, either vertically or horizontally, the bridge itself becomes uh, endangered, if not impassable, or, uh, and, and becomes functionally incapable of being used. Considering the fact that we have some tremendous uh, issues associated with transportation already, and that the uh, American the Society of Civil Engineers has pointed out that uh, the American infrastructure is not exactly the best rated uh, in terms of being maintained, uh, we need to take this under consideration uh, as we're moving forwards. In this discussion, I thought it would be very interesting to bring forward uh, a couple of different examples of existing potential impacts as has been identified through different exercises or scenarios as they're, as they're brought in. One of the more famous national level exercises that we've had was the Cascadia Rising exercise, which is on the left. That information is publicly available in terms of the presumptions as well as some of the considerations. And also the haywire scenario, the one on the right, which was put together by the USGS. These discussions and exercising, uh, exercise opportunities provide some background into the the types of the event, the types of the impacts upon the built environment, and the types of the impacts upon the people that are involved. Further, these, this information can be used to be uh, developed for events for states or jurisdictions or entities that are not directly impacted but would be impacted by an event occurring someplace else. So as a simple example of that, we need to be able to take into consideration um, again, the transportation infrastructure, uh, whether that transportation is roads or whether it's pipelines, the energy sharing infrastructure, uh, predominantly electric, the uh, communication infrastructure, an infrastructure which can be co-located and therefore at, uh, at, at, a, at a mutual risk, i.e. if one uh, happens to fray or crack or break, it directly impacts the other component that's there too. Interestingly, uh, Arizona recently did an exercise, which they used the Hayward scenario, uh, where they said that if this uh, Hayward scenario were to come into play, that the impact to them would be about 50,000 people coming into Arizona needing shelter. So there are opportunities to use this uh, in type of information to help develop your own uh, risk analysis and uh, thought processes to be able to work with it. But let's get back to the post-earthquake investigations. In my mind, uh, obviously one of the key components of the earthquake investigations is to improve the science. That allows us to be able to quantify the hazard itself uh, much better, uh, specifically to be able to do more appropriate mapping with respect to fault lines, to be able to do more measuring with respect to the uh, potential magnitude of the event, to look at considerations such as liquefaction, uh, so, in, in essence, this increases the base knowledge of the event, but just as importantly, you have the opportunity with the event occurring to be able to do the ground truthing of the assumptions that had been made before. 
that ground truthing of the assumptions makes that information applicable or potentially applicable to other faults or other hazards that exist also. Uh, this creates now when we take that science and then start applying it in a risk assessment perspective, uh, specifically towards the built environment and towards uh, human uh, issues, we look at the or environmental issues for that matter, we look at the probable or possible impacts in relation to the probability of occurrence. Long story short, this is kind of like the old risk formula that we used to be taught, uh, but it's there's some discussion on, on whether that's actually a formula or not. So as a consequence, it's easier just to say it this way to discuss the relationship of, of what happens. So, but if we identify, for instance, that the ground shaking that has occurred at an event is having a, a, an impact of, upon unreinforced masonry structures, and then we recognize that the probability of occurrence of that type of an event occurring again now leads us to be able to make a risk assessment to say that the unreinforced masonry structures are going to be at greater risk than potentially we had originally conceived of before. That type of a, an assessment then can lead towards the, the development of policy, whether that policy is uh, production of new building codes or land use items, or looking at how uh, additional non-structural reinforcement of, um, uh, of structures can occur and then being able to take those policies to address the event impacts of the risk and then apply those policies through the prioritization of options and then the actions to be able to take. Now note that I wrote down their development of policies on that last bullet point again. And that's because this is a cyclical action. Uh, if you've identified policies that work or don't work, as a result of the action and the implementation, then that provides you the information to be able to go back and start the uh, analysis cycle all over again. There are plenty or several existing frameworks and resources, but before I get started with discussing this a little bit, I need to point out that, that there is no single national framework that has to do with clearing houses. There are a lot of good practices that are out there. There are a lot of shared concepts, uh, but there is no singular identified uh, framework with respect to how is it that you do this. Now, there is some discussion there when we're looking at uh, uh, different components. And so I've created some, uh, there's no one size fit all is what I'm saying. So I've created some resources here, I listed some resources with uh, links to be able to look at and compare in their own right. The first mandated clearinghouse was uh, in California following the 1971 San Fernando earthquake. Uh, and then as you can see, we published a model plan in 2001. Utah came in with 2001. Very importantly, uh, a plan to coordinate NEHER post-earthquake investigations was a, was a document, a report that was written, which created uh, some of the CUSAC or Central U.S. Earthquake Consortia efforts to adopt and create clearinghouse plans for their uh, region. One of the key components of that is that they already have memorandums of understandings and agreements in place. We do have existing frameworks and resources as we're continuing forward. The closest thing to a national framework is the USGS Circular 1242 written in 2003, which is uh, now being looked at in terms of being updated or has the potential of being updated very shortly. Some additional resources there are listed. There are some technical earthquake physical requirements you gotta be in. Where is the physical structure that you're gonna be? Is it safe? Does it have power, water, communication? Uh, what are the who are the personnel that are going to be there? Not only to be out into the field, but the uh, to run the clearinghouse, uh, and that includes administrative and logistics staff. Logistics: well, How are things getting in and out? Does your transportation or supply lines uh, exist? And let's look at uh, administrative components with documentation, uh, accountability processes, budget, and finance. Documentation is critical when you're looking at the cost of, of what's going on, uh, as well as who's doing what where. And then the accountability is if you've got people out in the field, which is a potentially in a hazardous environment, how are you taking care of them? Are they accounted for? When do they report in? 
Most importantly, you need to be able to have some kind of a framework or a plan in place and then which defines the conditions that you implement the plan. What level of event is required? What measures of impacts? How soon after the event? Who's on the call down list? Who actually goes out and opens the door? And do you have a go kit where your equipment is set up to be able to uh, uh, operate if you're working remotely or away from your regular office? Clearinghouse connections to emergency management are critical. There are essentially four phases of emergency management they used to teach us. Uh, in response capacity, you've got a better, you got the information with the clearinghouse being able to provide better understanding of current conditions because that helps to guide resource allocation and uh, effectiveness and most importantly, the safety of response personnel. Again, I need to point out clearinghouse people are investigating situations they are not response personnel. They should under no circumstances put themselves into hazard uh, to try to do any types of rescue or anything. They don't have the equipment. Uh, they don't have the training. They should not be doing that. Their information is to be provided uh, to allow uh, the actual first responders to be able to do that. The recovery component allows for documentation of impacts. Again, uh, resource allocation, prioritization, Mitigation are actions that are taken to reduce impacts from future events and it supports the hazard identification and risk analysis. And then we get into the preparedness, which is understanding who is impacted and how that leads to the development of targeted outreach to that population, as well as improved planning. Remember that I referenced that approximately 13% of the people in the United States have um, are, are special needs per people. Now that can mean that they don't necessarily speak a language that is common to your community. There are other clearinghouse connections to emergency management that are beneficial to the clearinghouse. Uh, coordination of mutual aid, uh, logistical support, administrative support, and the ability to support a singular message that goes from the clearinghouse and the state EOC. And that should be done at least once a day to lead to a shared understanding of objectives, information and gathered uh, and, and also more importantly too, uh, in what is needed at the clearinghouse and can it be achieved or received from the emergency management office of emergency management for your state. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have follow up questions for me, I'll be more than happy to respond to them. Uh, if you wish to email me uh, offline, obviously I'm very available for you. Uh, thank you.